Going to call this meeting to order. Uh, I want to thank everyone for being here, and I want to especially thank uh, some of the members of the General Assembly who are with us today. Uh, Representative John Fraley of uh, Aradale County, uh, Representative Ted Davis of New Hanover County. Okay, Ted. Uh, Representative Jim Bradford of Mecklenburg County. Jim, thank you for being here. And Senator David Curtis. Senator, thanks for being back. Ch Chad, I didn't, I wasn't sure you'd gotten here. So Chad, Senator Chad Barefoot is here as well. Thank you, Chad. Any, any other members of this General Assembly? We're gonna, we're gonna jump right into our agenda and I'm gonna ask uh, Margaret to, to make a few opening remarks. But before I do that, uh, I've, uh, Harry Smith has asked for a brief moment. An uh, important matter, too, I might add. I want everybody to pay attention. I, uh, as you know, um, we got a, a big event in Greenville, North Carolina Saturday, right? <laughs> big deal. So a lot of you, you know, I, I really got close to Woodson when he was on my committee. And over several uh, meetings, he really professed his love of East Carolina and, and uh, told me he had a difficult time, you know, hiding that. So on behalf of the Pirates, I wanted to uh, give Randy something to wear. Randy? Uh, thank, thank you, Harry. Uh, just one last recognition. Uh, Ed Broadwell is with us today. Ed, as you know, is a former member of the Board of Governors and is currently serving as chair of the Board of Trustees at Western Carolina. Thank you for being here. Margaret? Good morning, all. Randy, as you can say, I see I'm in solidarity with you today, but come Saturday, I, I don't know. Uh, good morning. And thank you, everybody, uh, for being here. It's great to see so many familiar faces, and uh, I hope you all had a good summer. We have a very busy fall ahead of us if we're going to make our deadlines and be ready for the legislative session. We've had a good series of telephone committee meetings earlier this week, and as we've discussed, Addressing most of our transactional items and other routine business during those calls allows us to devote more time in our face-to-face -face time together to for strategic planning and items more properly discussed in person as we will do this morning. I appreciate your flexibility and willingness to accommodate those calls, especially given this holiday week. We have a packed schedule today beginning with a two-part policy session this morning that will help inform our discussions on strategic planning. First, Andrew Kelly, our new Senior Vice President for Strategy and Policy, will present on trends in access and student success, both nationally and in North Carolina. While you've heard from Andrew before, this marks his first official board meeting and his fourth week here at General Administration. Welcome, Andrew. We're thrilled you're here. He'll be taking on the bulk of the work relative to the shepherding of the strategic planning as it relates to our staff side of the business, and I appreciate his work on that. Andrew will be followed by Matthew Pellish, Senior Director of Strategic Research and Education at the Education Advisory Board. You received Matthew's bio in a background paper he shared in your board materials. Given the board's interest in Tennessee's performance funding model, which you will recall that Governor Bredesen discussed during our July meeting, and the growing prevalence of his approach as a tool to, prefer, to improve performance around the country, we asked EAB to provide an overview on this topic. Matthew will talk with us about the various types of performance funding, point out some reasons for successes and challenges experienced by other states, and share some insights that might help us develop a successful model. Looking forward to this afternoon, our standing committees will discuss and finalize the definitions of the strategic themes of, of access, student success, affordability and efficiency, economic impact, and excellent and diverse institutions. The committees will review national trends specific to their respective themes and be begin discussing the goals that will guide the system's work on each priority. 
thank you in advance to the chancellors who will help guide those discussions. Last week, uh, we at General Administration hosted a half-day meeting with the chancellors to discuss several issues, including the strategic plan and campus culture this fall. And I was once again reminded of how instrumental the chancellors are to achieving our collective success. I was also reminded by our chancellors and our in their collaboration with their boards of trustees, which have developed their own strategic plans, and we must work together to ensure that there is alignment and harmony between their plans and ours. We look forward to our committee chairs reporting out the final definitions tomorrow and between now and our October meeting, we expect each committee to continue their work on goal setting. At the same time, we'll encourage working to engage our campus constituents across the system in discussions about the strategic plan. Chairman Bissett and I had the pleasure of meeting with representatives from the faculty assembly last week, their ideas about how best to engage the campuses and about the issues on which we might focus our plan were very, very helpful. We look forward to extending those conversations to faculty and staff more broadly and to students uh, and other institutional leaders as well. Andrew Kelly and his team are working on a plan of engagement that would create multiple opportunities for channels for faculty and others to provide recommendations and input on the strategic plan for the board's consideration. Further details on that will be shared in the coming weeks. We've set an ambitious target to reach agreement on a slate of goals for full board approval in December. However, as Champ and I have discussed, we must do this right for the people of North Carolina, and we should feel comfortable, should we not feel comfortable with our progress come December, we will absolutely reevaluate the timeline. As you've heard me say before, paramount to this process is a resulting plan that the board can fully own and support. The last thing we want to do is move forward with a plan that misses the mark. We must have clear, measurable goals with timelines and targets that hold us all accountable going forward. I know many of you have already devoted a great amount of time to the strategic planning process. I thank you for your efforts, and I especially thank Chant Mitchell for his leadership as chair of the Strategic Planning Committee. We look forward to robust and productive conversations over the next few days, and now it's my pleasure to introduce Andrew Kelly. Andrew. Thank you, uh, Margaret. It's great to be back here. Great to be with you um, again. Happy to get another bite of this apple, um, as I'm sure your Carolina Panthers are uh, this evening as well. Um, <clears throat> I was charged uh, with catching folks up with uh, on trends in access and student success, both nationally and in North Carolina. Um, I have I've prepared a bunch of material. If I don't get through it all, it'll be publicly available. Uh, you can always click through it, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, I really want to do get uh, uh, Matt. Matt traveled all this way from Washington, D.C., um, uh, so I want to make sure we get to him uh, with adequate time. Um, so just a quick reminder, uh, uh, the last um, uh, board meeting was focused on the areas, uh, our strategic themes of economic impact and excellent diverse institutions. This meeting uh, designed to focus on access and student success. Um, that's why I'm here. Um, uh, a quick outline. Uh, I thought I'd try to motivate our discussion with just a broad question. Why should we worry about student access and success in this state? Um, uh, then we'll talk about trends in higher education access, trends in student success, and some policy implications, which I think will lead into Matt's discussion of performance-based funding uh, pretty well. Uh, so I wanted to lay a puzzle on the table. Right? So North Carolina has one of the fastest growing economies, uh, one of the fastest growing populations in the country. We have a top state university system with comparatively low tuition and above average completion rates. And yet, North Carolina's per capita income is, uh, it ranks 39th in the country. Um, it has fallen since 2005 as a percentage of the United States per capita income. We also have among the worst rates of economic mobility in the country uh, for native-born North Carolinians. Uh, the Belk Endowment just did a study uh, earlier this summer, um, and it found that uh, 20, using the Equality of Opportunity Project data, found that 22 of 24 commuting zones in North Carolina fall in the bottom quarter nationally when it comes to economic mobility, students chan children's chances to rise uh, higher than their parents. Let me be clear about this. The UNC system did not cause this puzzle, okay? But it has a massive opportunity, tremendous opportunity to help solve it. Um, and it starts with student access and success, with improving rates of student access and success. That's because um, higher education can be a mighty engine, in the words of President Friday. This is a slide that you may remember from my, my first talk. 
This shows the chances of move, uh, uh, the chances, uh, sorry, the, the quintile, uh, your adult, the quintile you fall into as an adult if you were born in the bottom, and it's disaggregated by your education. So in the gray is you, you earned a college degree, uh, a four-year college degree, and orange is it, it, or maroon, depending on your computer, uh, if you did not earn a degree. You can see here, if you, if you earn a degree, you have a 10% chance. If you're born in the bottom and you earn a degree, you have a 10% chance of winding up in the bottom as an adult. It's nearly five times as high if you don't earn a degree. And the effect is actually uh, even more impressive, in my opinion, for the second quintile. If you're born in the second quintile, you have a 40% chance of reaching the top quintile if you earn a, a four-year college degree. Um, so it's a mighty, it can be, can be a mighty engine, but it leaves many behind. So this is one of my favorite slides. Uh, this comes from the Education Longitudinal Study. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it followed uh, high school sophomores in 2002 for 10 years. And the number I want to draw your attention to, this chart disaggregates uh, by SES and by math achievements. So math achievements along the x-axis and the colors are low SES, middle SES, and high SES. Socioeconomic status is an aggregation of income and, and, and occupation. Um, so the number I want to draw your attention to is here. So if you're a low-income student, if you were a low-income student in 2002, high school sophomore, and you scored in, in the highest quartile on the math achievement assessment, your probability of earning a bachelor's degree in 10 years was the same as an affluent student who scored in the, in the second, second quartile. Right? This, so we're controlling here, we're sort of controlling here for ability, right? A lot of the, a lot of the gaps we see are, based, are, are because of preparation and, and inadequate um, K-12 education. This sort of controls for that and it shows you this is sort of, th these are the people that are being left behind. Um, these, these, these numbers obviously are, are following 2002 high school sophomores. I doubt it looks any different now, and, if, and, it, and it may even look worse, frankly, um, given the trends in, in, in uh, intuition uh, and other things. So <coughs> the story on access and completion. We've made lots of gains. We've made, we've made uh, large gains in access, but stubborn gaps still remain, as you saw in the last slide. Graduation rates have actually declined slightly. Uh, not the institutional graduation rate that we look that we know from the federal data, but if you actually look at stu uh, if you follow students over time, National Student Clearinghouse finds that the, the rates have actually declined somewhat uh, in recent years, um, and, and and that's true of uh, four-year publics as well. Um, uh, demographic gaps are pronounced in college completion. The UNC system, we know college completion rates are above average, but there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, so let me walk through some, some, some ideas on access. And part of what I'm trying to do here is provide the committees that are going to work on these issues on a strategic plan with some, with some, some things to think about as far as measuring access. Um, so should we measure access? Well, the, most simp the simplest measure of access is enrollment growth. Have our enrollments grown? Are we, are we providing access to more students? Does the UNC system reflect the state as a whole? Slightly different question. Um, are there participation gaps between groups of otherwise qualified students uh, between different demographic groups? So nationally, we've, we've seen enrollment growth. Uh, it, it really peaked during the recession because uh, the, the, the down economy led people back into the, back into the higher ed system. It's kind of tailed off a little bit, but, but that equates to a 16% increase over this time period. North Carolina basically mirrors it. Uh, uh, growth in enrollments kind of tapered off just a bit. Again, a 15% in increase. The question is, though, is the system keeping pace with changes in the K-12 system? So this just plots the change over time in graduates uh, from uh, K-12 schools here in North Carolina and, and UNC undergrad enrollments. And as you can see, the K-12 system is growing much faster than, uh, than, the, UNC, than the UNC system. Um, and the growth is particularly marked among traditionally underserved groups, right? So the Hispanic population between 2006 and 2015 in the public school, K-12 public school is 239%. I couldn't believe that. Uh, this is from federal data uh, between 2000 and 2014, different time frames, so not, not exactly comparable, but the number of receiving free or reduced price lunch in North Carolina, which is traditionally an indicator of economic hardship, uh, disadvantage, grew by 330,000. That has a lot to do with the economy. It's not just in-migration of folks who, who are of families who are poor. Um, it also has to do with the fact that many more people were, were, were receiving those benefits uh, during the down economy. Nationally, we know we've seen we have persistent gaps in college entry by income. This is from a study by Martha Bailey and Susan Darnarski, the University of Michigan, uh, National Bureau of Economic Research, released it in 2011. This compares two different birth cohorts. So uh, children who were born in the 1960s, in the early 1960s, to children who were born in the 1980s. Um, and you can see, so this is the lowest income quartile. 
you can see the lowest, the group in the lowest income quartile did make a gain, 10 percentage point gain in, in enrollment in college. Um, but, the gain, but they're not keeping pace with their, with their upper income peers because they, that gain was even larger, right? So we know the persistent gaps uh, in college entry by income. So let's shift now, knowing that, knowing that we have these gaps by income, does, this, does the UNC system reflect the state as a whole? Uh, demographically, it looks pretty good, um, with the exception of Latinos and Latinas. Um, it's about a five percentage point gap. But I'd like to, to draw your attention again here to the low income, uh, families earning under $50,000 a year, 10 percentage point gap. Um, rural, county, rural counties, uh, or folks from rural areas, eight percentage point gap. Tier two county that, uh, on the tier, tiered system of economic disadvantage, economic hardship, uh, another 8 percent gap. And then men, six percentage point gap between men and women in terms of um, this compares, uh, I should have said this up front, but this compares the undergrad, undergrad in-state headcount to the North Carolina population based on the American Community Survey. So what, well, what do we know? Again, a lot of the gap in low income, uh, among low income students is likely to do with preparation and, and, and meeting minimum admission requirements, right? That's explaining some of this. But our friends from Gear Up shared some data um, uh, in some counties that they work in. So uh, Lenore County, Scotland County, and Yancey County, very different counties demographically. Um, they shared some data uh, that showed that qualified students are just not enrolling anywhere in North Carolina. So of the, of the approximately 1,100 graduates from the Gear Up high schools in those counties in 2014, this is the punchline. 477 didn't enroll anywhere, a lot of them because they were, they were not prepared for college. 133 of those students, 12% of graduating students, met UNC minimum admission requirements. They didn't go anywhere. Some of them were making, probably making a, a, a fine decision. They got a good job and they were going to join the workforce. Um, maybe some had an apprenticeship or some other, uh, some other pathway. But these are the students that, that, that were missing. Um, and and, and, and we, can, we can figure out ways to go out and find them and, and grab them. Obstacles to access. I've already talked about academic preparation. We know there are college readiness problems. Um, information about higher education options, financial aid, how to fill out a FAFSA. And I put, on, I put up here showing up because people who study what they call summer melt have found that students that take all the steps necessary to enroll in college just don't show up on the day classes start. Um, uh, you know, and, and in some urban districts, it's 40% of students fit into that category. This is work by Ben Castleman and Lindsay Page. Um, can't ignore, obviously, the cost of attendance. Some students just don't have the money after you account for Pell Grants and, loan, and federal loan limits. Um, and maybe their parents can't actually get a loan to cover the rest of the tuition. Um, and then, of course, adult students, right? We don't want to forget about adult students who either don't have a credential or, or are partly home, as, as, as folks like to say in this, uh, this state. Um, they have work and family commitments. Um, those, are, those are clear obstacles to access. They need flexible programs and flexible uh, uh, schedules. Uh, so the caveats, of course, access without attention to success can have unintended consequences, right? We've seen this where encouraging students who are not prepared to enroll in school who then take on debt and then drop out without a credential, they can have significant repayment problems. I talked about this in my last talk. There's also, the, there's also uh, uh, potential for reduced productivity in terms of public investments, right? So, so to the extent we're measuring our productivity in terms of, of uh, spending per credential completed or spending for positive outcome, if we're only focused on access and we're not focused enough on, on student, the student success side, we're actually going to reduce the productivity of those public investments uh, the way we measure them. Um, and some obstacles are important to human capital production, right? This is one I think it's really important to remember, and it gets at some of the potential perverse incentives here, right? If, if what we do is we sort of lower um, uh, academic standards and academic rigor, right, we're, not, we're going to wind up in a, in a world where we're printing a lot of diplomas or actually inviting a lot of folks in, but not necessarily adding to the stock of the state's human capital. So I'll move on to student success. Um, again, measuring student success, retention and completion rates, we're all familiar with those. Time to degree, uh, so not just did you complete a degree, but how fast, how quickly did you complete it? Student learning, I know that's been a big topic around here. Um, Labor market success, North Carolina has some terrific data on that. Um, and then sort of other questions like quality of life, well-being, student satisfaction. How do graduates do on, on things other than just their job prospects? Do they feel like they're engaged at work in their communities? Do they have a high quality of life? Um, we, know, we know North Carolina is a, a UNC system is a leader on completion rates. Um, the federal data haven't caught up yet to, to UNC's data. Um, federal government moves slowly. Um, uh, this is the standard federal six-year graduation rate. Um, 
Uh, most of you probably know this is a flawed rate. It doesn't count transfer students. It doesn't count students that uh, uh, enter in the spring. It only counts first-time, full-time students. So it leaves a lot of students out. Um, if, we, if we include students who finished at any UNC, not just the UNC campus they started at, uh, UNC, the UNC system looks, looks even better. Though, you know, and the, the access doesn't even go all the way up to 100, right? But there's a lot of room here. Uh, not to say that graduation rates should be 100%, but there's room for improvement. Um, timely degree attainment. Okay, the good news, the four-year graduation rate across the UNC system is 10 percentage points higher than the uh, four-year graduation rate nationally for public colleges, right? The not-so-good news is that the four-year rates are low across the board, right? North Carolina is still below 50% on four-year graduation rates for, full, for first-time, full-time students. I'm uh, sorry, this is actually for any, and this is for any UNC campus. This is just the standard national rate. 10 percentage point gap, but they're low across the board. I mean, a, thir a third of students fin at four-year colleges finish in four years um, nationally, which is um, not good. Um, we know that there are gaps in college completion by family income. Um, the gap has actually grown over time. This is from that same paper that tracks the two cohorts, so 1980s, uh, in the 1980s birth cohort in red and the 1960s birth cohort in blue. Again, uh, low-income students have, have made, the students born in the lowest income quartile have made gains, right? They've made a big gain, actually, 5% to 9%. Um, but the gain was swamped by, uh, by the gains made by the top quartile um, and, and, and their peers in other quartiles. So we're actually sort of, they're actually sort of losing ground in this college, college attainment race. <laughs> Uh, we know there are gaps by race and ethnicity. This is, a, this is from, um, again, from the Education Longitudinal Study uh, on, the, on the access, again, as a um, um, socioeconomic status. Um, and then these are racial and ethnic categories. And so what you, what you see is that at, for the students in the lowest SES, with the exception of Asian students, you know, they're, they're, they're sort of completing a bachelor's degree at similar rates. Those gaps grow tremendously by race and ethnicity as you move up the socioeconomic spectrum. Um, you know, 40, 40 percent, uh, just over 40 percent of African American and Hispanic students uh, finish a degree, finished a degree from this cohort um, after 10 years, even, even though they were high socioeconomic status. Um, nationally, we know there's also a gender gap. Um, we saw a gender gap in access. There's a gender gap in completion as well. Uh, this is from that same study. Again, the gap gets bigger, actually, as you go up the, uh, as you go up the socioeconomic spectrum. Um, men, men are underperforming women when it comes to college completion, and that's true here as well. What does it look like in North Carolina? Well, not surprisingly, the gaps mirror the national picture, right, which is what you'd expect. Um, so we have, there's a 12 percentage point gap um, in, in, in graduation rate between Pell Grant recipients and students who didn't receive a Pell. That's, our, that's a proxy for low income status. Uh, there's a 17 percentage point gap between um, uh, non-minority and minority, under, underrepresented minority students. Um, and there's an eight percentage point gap between men and women. Um, so other outcomes of interest. Um, um, d degrees per FTE is one that has gotten some discussion around the country. You maybe have heard this before. This is a measure of productivity that doesn't, it's, it's not reliant on student cohorts uh, like the federal rate. So this just asks how many, how many um, uh, degrees are you producing? How many undergraduate credentials are you producing per 100 undergraduates that you enroll? Um, and for a four-year college, the closer to 25, the, the, it means the, the better you're doing as far as a four-year a four-year productivity rate, if you will. Um, student learning, as I said before, uh, big discussion. Labor market outcomes. North Carolina has really good data on this. Their data are limited because you can't follow students across state lines, and they don't cover federal employees uh, or military. Um, but uh, the, the latest data from North Carolina system find that 66% are employed or in graduate school in North Carolina at five years after graduation. Sorry, I should, that should be up there. I didn't put that in there. And the mean annual wage five years after graduation, $37,000, just over $37,000. Um, lastly, the measures of well-being. And I, this is where one, one thing I would recommend people take a look at the Gallup-Purdue Index. This is a project uh, uh, that, that Purdue University under, under Mitch Daniels' leadership and the Gallup uh, organization, the polling organization, they've partnered up and they've created a, uh, what, what they call the Gallup Purdue Index. Um, and it actually asks lots of questions that are unrelated uh, or, or not necessarily directly related to financial returns. So it's things like, again, are you engaged, do you feel engaged in your community? Do you score high on uh, 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 a sense of purpose about your life? The things that you know, often uh, universities say, we do more than just prepare people for jobs, rightfully so. Um, so 
uh, I do think this is something interesting to think about. Is it's, Can we use an instrument like this to think about the other things that universities are doing other than just um, preparing students for the workforce? So state policies to improve access and success. And I promised you I was going to get to the segue. And I'm only one minute over time, so I'm doing pretty well. Um, my mouth's a little dry, though. Uh, so uh, state, state policies to improve uh, access and success. And these are all the policies that we're discussing now um, as part of the strategic plan. And so uh, you know, put them all on the table uh, for discussion. Improving college readiness. This is a difficult, uh, so, sort of a difficult task for a university system in some ways to do, but there are things that, there are things the university system can do. Communicate clearly about the expectations for college readiness. What does it take to pass a college level course? Um, and are and students in the high school pipeline qualified uh, to do that, and if not, what are the steps they can take in the interim to do so? Obviously, the teacher prep pipeline is a big piece of the college readiness equation, something we're going to be thinking about and talking about um, as part of our strategic plan and the implementation uh, therein. Um, Need-based financial aid is part of the conversation, obviously. North Carolina has a tradition of providing need-based financial aid through the state, um, um, and that has to be part of the, the conversation. Um, uh, there's you know, new, some new research on need-based financial aid that suggests that it does raise the probability of completion. Um, there's other studies that suggest that pairing some of that need-based aid with academic incentives and benchmarks can actually produce even greater outcomes. Uh, there's also a, a, a counseling piece, an advising piece. Can we couple some of this need-based aid with better, better advising? And that gets to uh, also to the outreach and information to prospective students. These are the 133 students in those counties that, for some reason, didn't enroll anywhere. Maybe some of them would like to come to UNC. Maybe some of them would like to come to your campus. Um, there's, this is a place where we actually have uh, very good rigorous evidence that even small, inexpensive informational nudges can move people into the educational pipeline um, and get them um, uh, uh, to a campus, get them to enroll in a campus that's an academic match for them, where they're likely to be successful. Um, and they're cheap. You know, uh, the, the, the folks at the, uh, 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 Carolyn Hawksby uh, at, at Harvard and um, Sarah Turner at UVA sent students um, booklets through the College Board that just showed them, just hard copy, you know, no website, no fancy bells and whistles, hard copy. Here are the, here are the places you could go. Here are the net prices you're likely to see. Um, $6 a, 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 a packet, basically, was the overall cost. Um, and they found big effects on application and enrollment behavior. So, and then the last one is performance-based funding which I'm going to leave to my friend Matthew, who's going to come up and follow me. But I did want to just end on a couple notes, because I think this is important. So the caveats for this section. Uh, we, we need to be careful about navigating the tension between access and success, OK? And simply counting paper credentials can create perverse incentives. This is just diploma mill. This is the diploma, diploma mill problem, right? We do not want to be printing paper in North Carolina. We don't want this to be like the currency in Weimar, Germany, right, where people were paying for things in wheelbarrows full of uh, 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 Deutschmarks, right? Um, focusing only on graduation rates can lead to gaming and not gains in attainment. And what I mean by that is if you, if you set up, a, let's say, a, a funding formula that rewards only uh, graduation rates, right, the quickest way for a campus to get there is to just cut off anybody who has any risk factor of dropping out, right? Uh, and what you wind up with is you wind up with a much higher graduation rate, but actually educational attainment doesn't, uh, isn't, isn't added to, isn't, isn't sort of, it doesn't grow. Right? So these are the things I think are important to keep in mind. Um, and, and with that, I'm going to hand it over uh, to Matthew. All right, I think we're good. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, first off, I'd just like to thank everyone for welcoming me here to UNC System meeting, uh, the Board of Governors meeting here today. Uh, I was on the phone with my dad. I used to tell us a little bit of a story uh, but before I was coming down here. Uh, I talked to my father pretty regularly, and I was letting him know I was going down to UNC. I was going to be in, in Chapel Hill today to talk with you all and, and talk a little bit about the, the state of North Carolina and higher education in general. And uh, he got very upset. Uh, and the reason for this is my father is a, a very diehard college basketball fan. Uh, and when it comes down to it, I can't figure out why. He's from Pennsylvania. He lived in Texas for a very long time, yet he is a Kansas fan. And, and I actually have no idea why he's a Kansas fan, uh, to, to state that as well. And he basically said, well, when you go there, you need to tell Coach Williams, I'm still very upset that he left Kansas and went to, to North Carolina. 
And I had to step back and, and say to my father, I, I don't think you know what I do for a living. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I really don't. It has no application here whatsoever. Um, so I always have to tell that as a little of what he was. He's still upset that, that uh, Coach Williams left and came here and did quite well. Uh, still holds that grudge apparently somewhere inside there. Uh, the other thing I always have to say is I, I take out my phone. I put it here on the, the table. I'm not checking Facebook at any time. I'm not checking social media. I've been asked if I do that during presentations. I, I don't. Perhaps other millennials who you see present might do something like that. Uh, but I actually have a pregnant wife at home. So I have an emergency ringtone that if you hear it go off, you may see a mat-shaped hole in the wall uh, as I sprint out of here, just to let you know. So uh, likely none of that will happen, but just want to give those caveats. What I'm going to talk about today is a little bit of our research we've done at EAB into what we call performance-based funding. I know it's been a topic of your conversation, something you've seen presented at previous board meetings as well. What I hope to do is give you a very large overview, a national picture, of what we have seen from states, from state systems, from institutions, from policy experts, and open this up to discussion and dialogue. Uh, what I'd like to do is, is hear from you, questions you might have, things that I can help clarify. Uh, very much like Andrew, I put a lot of information in here uh, and tend to go through it at a pretty good pace. But at any point, if you have questions, comments, concerns, anything like that, please don't hesitate to jump in uh, and let me know. When I, I think about performance-based funding, it's one of those topics that we have looked at for some time now, we've looked at for many years, and yet the uh, results are not necessarily concrete. We don't exactly have a great sense of, of what's going on. But I want to talk about these three distinct areas to give you a bit of that foundation. First is what we call performance funding 2.0, why it might work this time. And this is a bit of our second foray into performance funding in higher ed. Uh, we sometimes joke that performance funding has been the, the cicadas of higher education, comes out in force every 17 years or so, and that's why it's out here. But I want to talk about where it's come from, where it's going. Uh, I'll then talk about balancing competing goods. There are many questions to ask when thinking about performance funding. And within any system, within any institution, there are the goods that you have to put in terms of the mission of different institutions, the mission of different student populations, the focus on what outcomes to track, all of those different competing goods. And I'll lay out some of the questions for those. And finally, I'll talk about the results. What have we seen? What have good data and studies been able to prove or show about performance or outcome-based funding? And again, the, the results vary, and there are lots of questions that remain in terms of what will happen. But I'll walk through each one of these in turn and, and give you an idea of what's going on. The easiest part to start with, who's doing what and how many states actually have a performance or an outcomes-based funding system? Now, at, at current, when we looked at before 2010, we had about four states, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Ohio, Indiana, that we're actively implementing, pursuing performance-based funding. Since that time, we've got now a total of 37 states that are pursuing this. Now, the problem with this is there's a disagreement on exactly how many states are pursuing performance-based funding. It's, again, not always set in stone, which is a bit of the challenge to this as well. Some states have started to put together a formula. Some states have put together a formula and not implemented such a formula. Some have fully implemented a formula. So again, there's not always clarity into who's doing what and how many states. The best example I can give of this is actually an anecdote. A few months ago, I was at a meeting at our own offices at EAB. We had about 50 provosts from around the country together discussing major issues in higher education. And I put up this same slide and talked about states that were pursuing performance-based funding or had systems in place. And I kindly had a provost raise their hand and say, well, actually, you can take us off that chart. We're no longer pursuing performance-based funding. I had their colleague from the same state sort of nudge them in the arm and say, actually, we're still pursuing it. We've just moved on to something else. And so they sort of retracted that. I said, well, no, never mind. That's OK. We're still doing it. Uh, so we don't have a clear idea. And, and even in a lot of cases, states don't always have the clearest idea of what their system is, how it's implemented, what it'll look like. These are the best numbers and best estimates we can give of, of current, of who's actually pursuing this. There's also definitions of, of what is performance-based funding. If you're going to say that we have it as a state, if you're going to say we're going to implement it and we're going to put this as a policy, how do you define it? Well, again, there's no one definition to it. It varies across states. It varies across institutions. Uh, there's uh, HCM Partners here that has put together an interesting topography, taxonomy, if you will, of different funding systems for outcomes-based funding. This is one of the best that I've seen to try to qualify the different components or the different characteristics of performance-based funding. I have no intention of reading through all of the different bullet points in here. I'll leave that for your review. But basically moving from type one, which is a very rudimentary type of system, very little funds are actually at stake, very little outcomes are necessarily tracked, it's not going towards base funding, it's much more bonuses, all of these different questions, not much of an effect or impact here. But you can move all the way up to say type four, which is a very advanced type of system of performance-based funding. Most would say that if we have a, a substantial amount of funding at risk, 
We have different metrics and weights by sector and by institution. If this has been something that's been put in place for several years and tracking the outcomes, you'd fall much more into the advanced category. Realistically, HCM, most people would only put two states in that category, Tennessee and Ohio, that have moved along in this way and have this much at risk. So you can see all the different variables, all the different characteristics of how this might be. And we also see states moving from one type to the other as you go through this, as things change, as the systems develop, as their criteria change. But you can use this as a bit of a base for this. Now, what we say, why might this work this time? Why might it be having a greater level of staying power? We go back to, what do you say, performance-based funding, or PBF 1.0. You see over on the left-hand side are just some of the states that initially pursued some of these initiatives in performance-based funding in the 1990s. What you have here are the years that they took to put a system in place and then end that system that they had put in place. Uh, over here, Colorado, two years. Georgia, two years. I call out South Carolina, it, your neighbor to the south here. Had a system in place, was working on a system that took about three years, and in the end actually pulled back and didn't implement that system. The, the true reason here was because I feel that they looked at inclusiveness as the major part of this. They wanted everybody to have a say in every single indicator, every single factor that would be tracked. In the end, they came up with 37 different key performance indicators. 37 different data points that you would track and that you report on outcomes, so much so that you could not really determine which one of those is going to make an impact at my institution. How can I use this to determine strategy and set forth what we're going to do for the future? Overly complex. The other issue that we saw in South Carolina, and that I've seen in quite a lot of other states as well, is the actual allocation of funds that would go towards outcomes or performance-based funding dropped from 38 to 3 percent after a budget shortfall in the state. At that point, many institutions would say, I have 37 indicators that I have to be successful on for 3% of the total state allocations to higher education. In the quick cost-benefit analysis of that, it might not be worth my time to do. This was what we heard. I have a picture up here of my colleague. Uh, literally, we tasked him with going out and putting together all the different performance-based funding systems, trying to tell us and define what states were doing what. This is the Excedrin migraine headache that he got every day in trying to do that. Because there was the, the lack of consensus, the lack of agreement of exactly what performance-based funding is, who had it, how long it would be, what the indicators would be. Uh, and a great report here is state officials not infrequently disagree in their understanding of what PBF is and whether their state even has it. The same thing of our provost who is sitting in the room, not necessarily understanding. Do we have it? Is it implemented? What is it? That's a little of where we came from. Uh, I do jump here to, to why this is a little bit more important today and what has been a, a big part of the dialogue. Many people say we've already talked about the, the funding of higher education in the country. And if we look at state funding of higher education, it had declined, particularly in the coming out of Great Recession era. We saw a very, very large uptick in tuition dependence of schools, relying more on student tuition than on state funding dollars for public education. What we look at now is that state appropriations across the country in aggregate are up by a few percentage points. They've come back a little bit. There is general agreement it's not going to go back to where it was pre-recession in terms of levels. There's still the feeling that state funding is continuing to decline, that a lot of our reliance is on tuition dollars, is on other sources of revenue for the institution. Now, what we would hear from many institutions is they say, we see performance-based funding, we see this system of outcomes-based funding as a better way to accommodate or in some cases even hide some of the cuts that we see in terms of funding. These are some quotes that we had from some administrators that I think are good to, to quantify or sum this up. Harder to detect cuts that, as we see declining funding, some individual institutions see more fund funds under competitive performance-based funding formulas, but most schools will be losers, and there may be less overall to go around. I wonder if uh, a little motive of performance funding is to continue the trend of defunding public higher education while avoiding the publicity fallout. This is a quote from a, a senior administrator of a public uh, master's institution. The feeling was that as we saw the shrink, some people would do well, some people would get more funding from the state, but most would not. You'd get a, a, a smaller part of a shrinking pie of funds. That's what we have in that, that second quote as well. That if it doesn't get traction, it'll be because the increase in outcome-based funds is dwarfed by the decrease in overall funding. The pie overall is shrinking over time. Th that was a little of how this was viewed in terms of what was funding and why people saw this might be the way that we can focus and concentrate some of the funds coming from state or going to public higher education. That's a little of the sentiment. That's a little of what we heard in the dialogues. But the reality is that there is still a, a great focus on implementing these systems. There's a focus on tracking outcomes, looking at performance. And so I want to show you what we've heard in a lot of our conversations, a lot of the dialogues around what goes into a system. When it comes to the model, when it comes to what a state might implement, what a system might implement as well, I'd say here are the, the big questions. Here are the competing goods that most institutions have to wrestle with when figuring out performance-based funding. 
over on the left, I'd say the current pressures are most on what are the right measures. And this is the balance of uh, mission, diversity, types of institutions, the balance of the different types of schools, colleges, universities that we have within a given system. I'll talk a little bit, how do we account for diverse missions? We certainly have state flagship institutions. We've got those that have a very research focus. We've got those much more ac access, mission focused types of institutions. Do we measure them on the same scale? Can they be put up against one another when it comes time for competitive funding? Are there students, are there populations, are there even academic programs that we overweight? We have students that are more successful. Andrew talked a lot about our different students that come to higher education. We'd even get to the program level. Do we overweight some of those in the funding formula? Uh, do we look at intermediate achievements? Do we look at just completions? There's a lot of questions of do we track credit accumulation? That students that get 30 or 60 or 90 credits towards a degree? Or do we just reward the degree that is attained? How do we balance those? And do we track career outcomes? How do we track career outcomes? We talked about this as well. Very difficult to do across state lines. We have students moving. There are questions of FERPA regulations beyond that. There's lots of questions about how do we track career outcomes. Can that be a part of the funding formula? And then the future needs, I'd say, are uh, the change levers. How much funding is at risk? Maybe one of the biggest questions that states will put out there. How much of the funding to public education should actually be measured against an outcomes-based system? How do we manage the movement towards a system like this for different performers? Is there a transition period that we can put in place? These are the main questions, and I want to just give a brief overview, an example of each one of them, uh, and then turn over to some of the results we've seen before we take questions and, and open it up for dialogue. I start with the, the questions of the design flaws that we saw in previous formulas and how that's starting to be corrected now. We look at, I'd say, PBF 1.0, moving to the 2.0 model here. Most of what we saw previously in, say, the South Carolina model, other models, were most of the funds were in bonuses. This was outside of the core funding that an institution would receive. And in that way, it was only a bonus that an institution would receive, not necessarily losing core funding. Most of what we see now are core funding at risk, or the base funding going to public institutions being up at risk and being measured in these pieces. The trivial funds, I think, is another piece, that if it's only a very small percentage, 1%, 2%, which we do see quite a lot of, how much effort am I going to put into achieving these outcomes or focusing on them if there isn't actually much in, the, in terms of benefit to me as an institution from a financial perspective? Now we see at least many institutions focusing, saying, well, it has to be greater than 8%, 15%. Those sometimes are tracking Ohio and others have 100% of funding coming from this type of model. There is real value to then seeing that. There is signaling value to having more than 15% as well. So we want to make sure there's those types of pieces. And also tracking counts versus rates. Uh, this was an interesting piece of not just tracking the percentage of a given cohort that might graduate, but aggregate enrollment and aggregate completions tracked year over year for an institution. In general agreement, this is what the new system was starting to move towards, that PBF 2.0 model that you'd start to discuss was trying to do more of this. But I, I always say, how do we then get to that balancing? If we take that into account, those three characteristics, and we look at, at what people are doing in terms of creating their formula, creating their funding, uh, the question that first comes up is, how do we account for diverse missions? Now, uh, just to, to give you an idea of what we have here on this side, uh, up at the top, we have tried to chart out where we see different states along a continuum of these competing goods. Uh, just to have these for generally each question we ask. This is not law put into place here. This is not exact in nature because of, again, the variability we found. This was our research team's best efforts at trying to put a state where we thought, saw them along the continuum. So this may even have changed in the time that I'm talking here today, and a state may have moved in this. But you have on the left-hand side very standardized indicators. You have over on the right-hand side very customized indicators of what this looks like. And states can fall out anywhere in here. There are three states that I call out here to give you an idea of where they fall on the continuum. Uh, Tennessee has standard indicators. They have standard 10 criteria that every institution is going to be measured against for their outcomes. But there are different weights that they have for each different type of institution. So this example I use, UT Knoxville, flagship research institution, differently measured into, uh, when compared to UT Martin, a more access-focused, mission, educational type of institution. I'll show what that looks like. Uh, Missouri has more of a success menu of approaches. They've got four different indicators, four different large areas or buckets that you can actually look into. And then you have specific criteria, specific outcomes that you track that you can pick from that list. Best way to describe it, and I'll show a little of that. And lastly, Pennsylvania is that you actually have all schools measured against five standard indicators. And then the schools themselves put together two of their own indicators that they feel reflect the mission, the values, the unique goals of the institution. So you have a blend of those that are standardized, but also incorporating some that are going to be a bit blended give you an idea of what this looks like. On this slide, we've got uh, Missouri over on the left-hand side, Tennessee over on the right. Your success menu for Missouri looks at student success, degree attainment, quality, financial efficiency, and then the optional metric that they can pick. 
Within that, you might pick any one of these different criteria that best reflects your institution. You might look at freshman to sophomore retention, or you could look at credit progression. For degree attainment, you can look at total degrees awarded or six-year graduation rate, and so forth and so on for each one of those categories. But it allows the institution to define what are the standard criteria we'll use within that system. Tennessee, I think, over on the right does this in terms of the more weighted formula that they have. And again, we took here Knoxville versus Martin in terms of the comparison that you'd look at. You have the 10 criteria that are listed across the left-hand side, students that have earned 30 credit hours, 60, 90, bachelor's and associate's degrees, and you can see how these types of criteria are weighted differently for different institutions. Best example, uh, Martin's going to be much more heavily weighted on bachelor's degrees. Uh, they're going to be more heavily weighted on master's degrees. They will not be weighted at all on doctoral or law degrees because there is no comparison there when you look at Martin versus Knoxville. These types of characteristics are the ones where you as an institution can set what yours will be within a standardized set of, of those kind of metrics. This is how you have those balancing goods. When you have the unique missions put in place, how you can balance those different parts together. The next part I think is a very large part of this conversation is can we overweight individual student populations? Can we overweight individual programs? Many states have taken into account, even as Andrew mentioned, Pell recipients, which is a bit of the proxy for low-income students in the country. The work that's done in terms of the outcomes for Pell recipients often has a, a bit of a, a completion premium or a promoter here that allows for increases for those institutions that do very well in terms of completions for Pell graduates. Uh, we also see this for other student populations uniquely tailored to the state that also fall in academic program areas. We've not seen this very large in nature. North Dakota has done this as a part of their funding formula where they started to weight individual academic programs they felt were necessary for the local community as well as for the state. So you see over on the right-hand side is that those programs in their priority disciplines of business, engineering, and health sciences have a premium in terms of the weighting that they get for the completions and the success of students in those individual program areas. I've not seen this in a ton of states. I've not seen everybody adopt this model, but it does go to meet the unique needs of the state, unique needs of the mission of the overall goals of the state authority that they have there. So you start to weight out different student populations and different programs differently. <coughs> Tracking career outcomes, I mentioned this very briefly because it is very difficult to do. Uh, the trick here in a lot of cases is that we've seen pushback from institutions about the FERPA regulations in terms of there are very unclear rules and no institution wants to come up in terms of risk compliance and other issues that they have here in terms of the release of data and information, especially as students move across states and across borders. The other thing that we hear a lot about is we survey our students. We get information about them on a regular basis of, of where they are, what they're doing, what career fields they're in, what their salaries are. The data that we get from those tend to be somewhat inaccurate, tend to be unreliable, and are also very expensive to implement year over year. The questions are, can we continue to track career outcomes in that way? States have stepped in here in some sense to take a more strong role in terms of tracking career outcomes. I mentioned the state of Florida because Florida has actually started to have a, a statewide database of all the career outcomes, particularly for their college system. It's be more of your community college type system here for tracking career outcomes. In this case, it is a database that pulls together information from uh, both the government, it pulls information from uh, the Bureau of Labor, it pulls statistical information from the universities themselves, and tries to give a year-by-year -year report of how students are performing in terms of their career outcomes, in terms of their salary data, in terms of the work that they're doing. It's an imperfect system, though, again, here as well, mainly because this was only implemented because of uh, something that happened back in 1995, where the state legislature in the state of Florida put together and mandated that this would actually happen, and from the state authority was able to collect that information and report it out. By that happy circumstance, when they put in their performance funding system, they were able to access this data and use it to track career outcomes. We've done a lot of research very lately uh, in terms of what we call the return on investment, the career outcomes in higher education that we see uh, across the country. And there's lots of debate about using salary as a, a credential, using that as a quantitative data point about success. Because there's a lot of comparison of first uh, destination after graduation, where salaries might be higher for some STEM grads versus, say, liberal arts grads. There's how do we track that longitudinally over time in terms of career earning over a lifetime. All of that gets very, very complex and very, very murky, I'd say, when trying to use this as a part of an outcomes-based or a performance-based funding formula. But certainly a large part of the dialogue or the debate there. Uh, and the last thing I do have to mention this as well, uh, is, is how we might track or how we might reward transfer. There's a, an ease of being able to actually track our first-time, full-time students coming to the institution, tracking how they are successful. But what about those students who transfer into the UNC system or transfer into one of our institutions? We put this out there because we have had this long haul of theory and feeling from institutions that a great unbundling may happen in higher education, where students do not go to one institution for 
four years or five years or six years for one program, but they collect credits from a variety of different places and from a variety of different institutions. And then they piece that degree together as they see fit, and this way can lower the overall cost of their education. Now, this has not necessarily happened just yet, but you can see how a student might start to be very critical of how much it costs to go to a higher education institution. We've got some of the numbers here that six years at a public university, and if we're looking here at College Board Trends and College Pricing, can cost on average uh, almost $140,000. Now, if I were to look at options for, say, two years at a community college and two years at a public institution and have that transfer opportunity, it would be about $65,000. Now, we see this as a new opportunity for parents, for families, for students to analyze and think a little bit more critically about where they go to school, how they go to school, how much it costs. What we started to see is then transfer friendliness being also built into the outcomes or the performance-based funding systems. The example I pull actually here is from Michigan, where part of their system actually incorporates these different criteria and funding eligibility requirements, all based upon transfer. So for institutions to be eligible for a 3% part of the funding pool in Michigan, you have to participate in the student transfer network. You have to have transfer articulation agreements and reverse transfer with at least three community colleges which means that a student can complete their associate's degree at the four-year institution after transfer. They have to accept dual enrollment credits from the high schools, and they have to have tuition restraint, which is a limiting on the increases they have in tuition. Only by doing these types of things, only by meeting these criteria, can you be uh, eligible for some of the bonus pool of money there for performance. So you start to track how we might have students moving through the system as well. That's a, a little of the initial questions about how you'd think about waiting and the different challenges that you'll face as you think about a, a system of this. The next, though, is, is what are the right change levers that we have here in terms of the incentives, the stability of a system? And the two big questions I, I'd like to mention here are, are, first, how much funding should be at risk? Again, there is no one right answer here. Uh, I wish that there were one criteria, there was one model that everyone said, this is the amount that you should have, but it's certainly variable across different states. Those that we have there at the lower end, we have Illinois, Massachusetts, Washington, Missouri, Wyoming, and others, have, we'd say, those trivial amounts of funding actually at stake. When it is such a low amount of under 2%, you have to, as an institution, put yourself in their shoes of saying, how much effort do we put into this? How much do we focus on the weighted criteria? Uh, some people would say, what's the point for us? We might be able to make that up in terms of some of our enrollments or make that up through philanthropy or other dollars here. Uh, we could put our efforts into that with greater success. We have others there that fall, um, say the, the bar, the line we're really looking here is about 15%. Most people agree that that's a bit of the visibility bar, where above that it seems to have more of an effect, seems to have a bit more of the impact for the institution in terms of what are the funds that are at stake here for these. The highest that we see on the chart are really looking at the states of Tennessee, Ohio, Nevada, North Dakota, where you're looking at fully somewhere between 80 and 100% of the funding is going to be based on the outcomes of the performance-based funding system. This breaks into things like completions, the same weighting we saw from Tennessee as well as others. But you have to still remember that even though that's 100% of the allocations coming from the state to higher education, that is still not the majority of revenues coming to those institutions. The majority of revenues, even in those states with the highest percentage of state funding, is still coming from enrollment types of criteria, tuition as well as external financial aid to those students at the institution. So there's still focus here that even though a lot of the funding from the state is coming from this, there's a big focus still on the enrollments, the tuition, the students coming into those institutions. There is no one right model for these as well. There's been a lot of disagreement about how much should be at stake. We've seen them shift from time to time. We've seen them move up and down. We've seen them go from high to low. Uh, no, again, one right criteria. But you can see the swath, a spectrum of different approaches from states here about what would actually be put at risk. When we think about managing the, the risk here, that's the other question that comes in. As we phase in a system over time, as we implement a performance or an outcomes-based funding system, what are some of the things to take into account here? And here's what we've seen some states do. We have uh, Washington, Missouri, and have learning years. These would be years where literally the institutions would not be affected by performance-based funding, but you'd be able to see how you would have performed if the system had been put in place. It allows a bit of that time for transition to institutions to understand what would actually happen to me. How do I prepare for this in two years or five years when it's fully implemented? Uh, we've seen stop-loss provisions. This is a, a limit in terms of the amount of funds that you can gain or lose given uh, a certain time period of one years or two years or five years. These have fallen out of favor, quite honestly. Uh, many of the conversations we've had with states of, of limiting the impact you'd see from the outcomes model, but we still have seen it as built in there to allow for some type of cushion for institutions not to see everything at risk. People see more of escalating risk pools, that money will actually increase in terms of the amount that's going to be at risk year over year in terms of, during the first year it might be 5%, in the second year 10%, third year 15%, and you can see it increase over time as institutions adjust. 
And the last one I think is very important is something we definitely found in Tennessee that is a great model that is more of the rolling averages. Instead of saying that it, we're going to track year over year, there's a three-year rolling average in which institutions are tracking their data and tracking their outcomes. And that way, one year of enrollment shortfalls or one year of particular challenges to the budget or the institution don't drastically impact negatively the institutions. So by doing those rolling averages, you're able to move into this uh, in a, a more stable way and allow for that sustainability moving forward. Uh, I'm going to jump to this as well, but the last piece that I'll mention from Tennessee before talking about some outcomes and, and opening it up to some questions here are allowing for scenario planning for institutions. I, I think one of the biggest things I, I heard in the process of this research were individual institutions within state systems saying, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know how the funding formula is going to affect us. We don't know how we can plan for this year over year. When I'm trying to put together my five-year or even a 10-year strategic plan or a five-year budget plan, how do I account for this new system in place? Tennessee's put together this uh, new tool that actually helps institutions anticipate what the impact will be. An institution within the, the Tennessee system can go in here and actually put in the changes they would see, put in their outcome metrics, and it will basically break out how they would compare to the other institutions within the state. It'll show them if they're going to receive an increase in funding. It'll show them if they're going to see, receive a decrease in funding. It can also change the accounts in terms of the state appropriations, if they should go up or down by certain numbers allows for this more interactive planning approach that's consistent across the system for all budget officers. Put this out there that it helps institutions understand if we are putting a system in place, how will it affect me? How do I use this to plan more effectively and consistently across all institutions within the state? And what that has led to is a little of this type of information. Uh, this comes from Tennessee when comparing the impact of their performance-based funding system from 2010-2011 years to 2013-2014. What you see is that there are winners and there are losers in the system that some schools have performed very, very well, have increased the overall funding that they are getting from the state. There are those that have also seen decreases and declines over that same time period. So there are questions of when we have these balancing goods, when we have this type of impact, uh, what do we think we would have in terms of creating a competitive environment among institutions? We see systems as being very collaborative in nature, working together for the greater good of the system. In some cases, many people argue this puts each institution up against the other in a very competitive way that has negative impacts, that there's no longer the collaborative approach to system operations. You can see here just a, a little bit of it that six schools together in Tennessee actually received less than 1% of a 14.6 uh, increase in Tennessee state funding. Most of that went to other institutions. We call out some of these that have taken a lot of steps towards student success, towards student retention, have done great jobs, but at the expense of the other institutions. So when putting these together in these types of competitive formulas, there will be winners and there will be losers. That's a very clear thing that we have seen articulated. So what I want to round out with are just some of the results. And again, limited results varying across the country, but those that I think stand out as being very important to recognize. The first are just some of the financial impact of performance-based funding or outcomes-based funding. And some key points that I think are very important to share. Uh, one is the decrease in Pell Grants per FTE that we saw in studies that were done of systems and of institutions that implemented performance-based funding. What does this mean? This means that we have fewer Pell recipients being admitted to performance-based funding campuses. In an effort to somewhat game the system, being the theory here, that we would admit fewer low-income students so that we could make sure that we were meeting the success and the completion goals and not taking the risk that might be associated with Pell recipient students. The other one that we see is the increase in institutional grant aid. This is the lower left. This could be better quantified as increase in merit aid to students, meaning we are putting more aid towards high uh, quality students, tracking those students, trying to get them in the door. Again, using the finances we have to get high quality students in so that we can make sure we uh, meet the outcomes goals that we have against the performance system. These would be negative impacts that we'd certainly be questioning uh, when you try to break this out. But again, very hard to break out these numbers from the studies that we've seen. So again, an aggregate of different schools that have done this. Uh, so still a bit of question of what does this actually mean for the institutions. Over on the right, we've seen an increase in terms of uh, student services expenditures, meaning we have taken money that have come from the increases in performance funding, or we have just tried to better improve our student outcomes, our student quality, student life on campus because of the, the impact of outcomes. The question again is, is, where, is the fun, where are the funds going in this case from student service increases? Some people say they go towards student success initiatives advisors, success coaches, academic tutoring, academic counseling, other pieces, but very difficult to break out. There's also been the increase in overall instructional expenditures, meaning we're putting more money into the classroom. We're putting more money into faculty, into teaching and learning within the campus. So it's perceived that those are the positive outcomes. 
So you're looking here at really from the financial side, there are the negative outcomes of not necessarily admitting as many Pell recipients, of putting a lot more money towards some of our merit aid and instructional aid, but some of the funds we have going towards student success, student teaching and learning. When we get to the other question of the mixed results around the country uh, is in terms of completions. And I think this is the hardest part because many people will say, we want performance-based funding, we want outcomes-based funding to be focused on the completions, on the graduation rates, on students getting degrees. Uh, quite honestly, the results are, again, very, very mixed around the country. We looked at a good study that was done of both two-year and four-year institutions. Uh, you can see that there are almost an equal number of positives and negatives. We had an equal number of institutions that by implementing performance-based funding had no change whatsoever in terms of degree completions or degree conferrals in a lot of these. So from the pure perspective of looking at degrees, uh, there's not necessarily a direct correlation here that success comes from performance-based funding in terms of outcomes of degrees. Again, studies are, are still mixed, the questions are still out on this, but there is no hard evidence that says performance-based funding leads to more degrees, leads to more credentials. There are more of the, the quanti qualitative evidence uh, of positive aspects and positive impacts of performance-based funding. Uh, awareness of state priorities. If we are tying funds to the priorities of our state, there's much more knowledge about those. There's funding, as we saw on the previous slide, dedicated to instruction, dedicated to student services and student success. Uh, we look at developmental education, we look at tutoring improving. In those systems where certain students are weighted, certainly they're getting their funds. We're focusing on those populations. Uh, there is a lot more professional support for teaching. The course sequence and the curricula have actually improved. As institutions tried to be more efficient, more effective, they would actually revamp the curriculum of their individual institution to make sure that it was meeting the needs of students, that it was in a way that was more successful, and also accommodating things like student major switching. When a student switches a major, they tend to have to go back and get more of the prerequisites again. We we're able to align more of our majors together. It allows for that timely degree completion in different ways. Those are some of the impacts we heard more anecdotally, not necessarily those from a, a strict data study that you would see in terms of outcomes. And the, the last piece I have to mention has got to be that no matter what you're doing in terms of, of outcomes-based funding, it is not a quick fix. The, the major results that we see show that there's a long amount of time that it takes for there to be success in terms of degree completions or outcomes for these models. If the goal is to change something for next year, performance-based funding and outcomes-based funding is likely not the right move. It is a long-term strategy for the institution or for the system to be thinking about from that perspective. Just some of the data here over on the left is it takes about seven years uh, from the data set of institutions and states that have implemented performance-based funding for there to actually be a, a change in terms of the four-year completions of degrees. About a seven-year lag time between the implementation as well as the outcomes of that. The question here is, is can we look at this as a long-term strategy and not as just the quick fix that would go to this? Again, the results are limited, but these are the best bit of outcomes that we can look at from institutions to actually track. Are we improving completions? Are we improving finances? Are we being more efficient as institutions? So I, I leave you with this slide again, looking at both the current and the future needs of institutions in terms of outcomes and performance-based funding. Some of the major questions that we have tried to wrestle with or tried to address in even looking at these systems or getting some kind of concrete answers about them. I, I think the, the greatest quote I heard is that the cement is still wet in a lot of states. We're not quite sure of what the outcomes will be. We're not exactly sure of what the financial outcomes will be. But there is general consensus that we would like to pursue and continue the discussions and find what the right model would be for an individual state. So I, I know this is me trying to go through as much about a, a complex financing system and complex performance-based system in approximately 35 minutes. Uh, I hope I was able to give you at least a good overview of what we have seen writ large around the country. And would love to open up for questions from you all, uh, as well as questions for, for Andrew and his presentation. Thank you, Matthew. Matthew going to take questions for a while. I wanted to remind you that if you have a question, a question, we have some people with uh, microphones that would like to get you on and ask you questions. Um, I think we have a microphone. <laughs> Obviously, you've looked at a large number of these programs. Um, following, trying to follow you on this was sort of like what I would imagine speed dating is like, although I'm too old to have done that. <laughs> Can you pull together for us and give us your estimation based on what you have seen of components of these programs that seem to be keys to success, that seem to have the greatest influence, and perhaps even more importantly, components that have either done no good or had a negative consequence? I can do my best to answer that question as well to get such a report out. The, the trick is that you have to look at the different weighting of this, that in total it's hard to say that one individual criteria led to success for the whole model. 
linking that up, it, it's the same thing that we look at from student success in general in the country. That institutions and systems that everybody focused on completion and retention of students will say we implemented 10, 20, 30 different changes on campus. Which one was effective and which one was not, is, oh, it's hard to make that direct connection. Uh, I can put together a point of here's the criteria that we have seen be most effective or that have been the most important in terms of determining the models. Uh, again, I don't have the greatest results that directly link to those, but I can put something like that together and say here's what I think. Most of them are, are laid out in here in terms of the questions to ask, the way to build them out. It's going to be unique to UNC though. You're going to have to look at your individual institutions, your individual uh, performance in that way. It will be very unique in that way, but I can put together those criteria. It'll be, I, I just want to admit, I cannot make the direct connection to exactly which metrics will be successful there. You've seen them, and, and you've been watching them for some years now, and you'll, a lot of times that's the best way to do it. Sure. The metric charts are great, but they also don't always illuminate a lot of things. I, I'd much rather have the judgment of somebody who's actually watched it. Sure. Can I call on anybody? I usually, I usually leave it to the chair to, to, do, to run the meeting. But. I got one for you over here. Okay. Uh, I'm wondering what, um, if there are any findings regarding uh, increased distortion of, of data that's reported. That's my first question. Uh, I would think that uh, professors and faculty are under a lot of pressure to make sure that they don't lose funding. That's number one. Number two, with all these schools, like the chart that you showed from Tennessee, where only two of the schools were positive and the rest were negative with regard to funding, what happens there? Is there a negative um, impact on uh, tuition? Uh, do the states do anything to, uh, to account for that? To answer your first question, I don't have anything that concretely says we have seen distortions in terms of data reporting. Uh, most of the data sets are handled by the states themselves and are often looked at in terms of, of again, cutting through data. Data is always a great murky area to either hide things or have a lot of questions go into those data sets. Uh, but I've not seen massive distortion of, of data and reporting. The, the question of data, and this is something Andrew even talked a little bit about, is how you might dilute academic quality. And I'm not sure if that's what you were referring to when you mentioned faculty in terms of their focus on funds, that we would have uh, degree inflation or grade inflation. Uh, of an individual program that I want my students to complete in a program, so I'll inflate the grades so that they get through, but the academic quality is reduced. Hard to track, again, hard to actually quantify unless you have some type of licensure tests or you have some type of assessment that's actually built into an individual program. Others don't have that as clearly. So there's lots of questions, again, about that type of data distortion. Um, as to your second question, if you could repeat it, I apologize. The, the, uh, the chart you showed that showed uh, two, only two of the schools in that state increased their funding does it put extra pressure to increase tuition and do the states allow that? I, I think it puts a lot of pressure on uh, the admissions or on the gateway in terms of higher education. That those institutions might then focus, as we mentioned some of the, the later data, of the quality of students that they enroll or the students that they are bringing to the institution or their admissions criteria of making sure the students they bring in might be able to bump up some of those numbers, allow them to compete more successfully in terms of performance and outcomes. Uh, it's also had them be a little bit more uh, strategic in terms of alternative revenues or other types of revenue streams to the institution. We've seen boost in terms of focus on uh, advancement and philanthropy. We've looked at alternative revenues and auxiliary revenues from those institutions. Uh, and some will even look even more at more of the efficiency side of that. That if we can reduce our overall costs and be more effective, that can lead to quality outcomes, but also reduce the, the financial costs of it. It does lead to, to competition from those institutions, though. The, the ones that you see that are the, the largest performers on those charts did some great things around student success in terms of tracking outcomes, tracking results that were going to lead to those end results. Uh, and then there's also the sharing, though. Uh, we did see the collaborative uh, learning that happens, that those that were successful were able to share some of those experiences with the other institutions in the system, which did lead to overall success or improvements on those sides. I'm sorry, I'm back there. Sir. Matthew, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I would hate to have to communicate that much information in 35 minutes. Uh, <laughs> by analogy, let me ask you to differentiate this. It seems in our medical uh, delivery system in the United States uh, recently, past eight years or so, there has been a similar analysis made and an imposed control system on individual doctors and doctors' practices, limiting time with patients, uh, limiting compensation to uh, how many patients you see, and so forth and so on. 
with less emphasis on personal interaction and personal uh, relationship between the doctor and the patient. Certainly efficiencies have gone up. Doctors spend less time with patients. Prescriptions are written with less time. But there is no guarantee that the actual care delivered is better. It seems to me that education is even more of an individual relationship-based uh, enterprise than medicine. And to control a, an institution by turning on and off the spigot based on arbitrarily set, or maybe not arbitrarily set, but based on criteria set by someone else is no guarantee in the long run that the education delivered will actually be better. Could you comment on that, please? I, I happily admit I'm not an expert on healthcare uh, and healthcare performance at all. My wife is. My wife works in, in healthcare research. Uh, I would love to call her on the phone and ask her some of those questions when they come up. Um, the, the only uh, reaction I would have to that and sort of commentary on it uh, is that when we think of the outcomes, we think of the focus of students and their engagement with academics or with faculty or with the, the core part of our institution. Uh, Andrew again mentioned the Gallup-Purdue Index, which actually tracks and shows that affinity of institution, lifetime success, uh, the uh, uh, sort of outcomes of a student in college or university are very directly related to their interaction with faculty members, the experiences they have on campus that can't be quantified always in the same way, that there are those kind of outcomes that are harder to track. Now, what we start to see, though, is, is when you look at these kind of formulas and you track outcomes, you think about where faculty spend their time and what they're doing and how they focus, uh, there is the specialization of those, the focus on, say, student success administrators. There are those who focus on advising or focus on um, career outcomes or focus on service learning beyond what faculty do. And we focus faculty time on teaching and learning in the classroom and research and those components that I, I think are most important to them. So that rather than trying to dilute the faculty time with students being pulled in so many different directions, you almost focus it in a lot of ways on the areas where faculty should be focusing that lead to some of those better outcomes. That's what we've seen in a couple of different models or seen the focus or the shift. And it can have both the qualitative benefits that we see from some of the surveys, but also the quantitative outcomes benefits in terms of degree completion, course sequence completion, et cetera, from other institutions. So there, there is a little bit of a fine balance there of, of focusing the efforts and times of our faculty, of our experts a little differently. Yes. Right. With the uh, big data available to us, mm -hmm. um, how much modeling has been done on this sort of a system, um, looking at uh, like a Watson trade-off analytics to see what the impact of these various decisions are and what the outcomes likely will be? Um, that's my first question. The second question is um, drilling down into departments rather than looking at the university itself or the system itself and then each university. Are there any performance-based um, models for department level? And then last question is, um, you know, how much can someone really impact the outcomes of these um, success metrics? So are we putting a model in place that someone can actually change and and succeed, or are we putting a model in place that's going to have an outcome that's just going down a path uh, towards that? Uh, I think that in the answer to your first question, the best example, the Tennessee modeling system that they have in place that allow institutions to see what will be the impact of the model for them is probably the best that I've seen that gives that pretty clear example of it. I, I would quote them and, and allow them to answer any more uh, detailed questions or specific questions about how that model is built or, or how they've seen it affect the performance of institutions. To your, your second question about department level incentives or department level performance, one that does jump to mind is, is one that we profiled at EAB. Uh, it's actually from the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire, regional part of the UW system that does track individual performance of academic departments. They have individual metrics around student success, around completion, around assessment in the classroom that allows them to put together a, a very large matrix that you can compare how the individual department is performing and how the individual department is compared to another department or all departments within the, the overall institution institu uh, in the university. From that model, they have small amounts of funding that are based on the performance of the individual units and the individual departments. It's not a massive amount of funding. It's not large base funding. It's additional bonuses that go to the departments to change the unit level performance of that institution. 
that's the one example that I can say comes to mind where they actually do track that level of departmental funding and departmental performance. Uh, I, I think overall, though, for the last part of your question, what we have seen is, is how do we improve the performance of those who may not see this writ large? If you're looking at the big picture of performance funding uh, and outcomes funding, how do we support those individual departments? Uh, in some cases, it's through data, through analytics, through better performance metrics, through curricular changes at the institution. All of those add up into trying to drive performance or drive changes at the individual department level and have been successful from the system down through the institutions, down through the individual academic departments and units on campus. So that's the, the best way I can answer that, that approach. Yeah, please. Hi, thanks so much for coming. So uh, you talked a little bit about the, the winners and losers, and, and uh, especially with Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And I guess my question is, is there a pattern in who you see as winners or who wins? Is it typically maybe a flagship university or a research-focused university? Have you seen any patterns in the systems that you've looked at? No, uh, is the, the short of that. And that's the trick of all this. You'd like to say that hi, I've seen a, a very distinct pattern that allows me to say, well, all the state flagship institutions where there is performance-based funding in place have done better than the regional institutions or other serving institutions. Uh, not seen that exactly. Uh, I, I give the one here, and there's been a lot of media stories about Austin P. State University in Tennessee. It's done phenomenal work in terms of student success, phenomenal work in terms of performance analytics for students to understand their degree programs. They are not the state flagship. They are a regional public serving part of the, the system there that has performed better than almost every other institution in that. So they'd be a bit of the outlier that sets apart from the rest. Their performance, their activities, the things they have done have been able to influence and even give guidance to other parts of the system for those institutional improvements. But I have not seen and neither have I seen a study that has shown there is one type of institution that does better than another. I think the weighting of the metrics goes into that as well. That if I'm being compared to the, the mission of my institution, the students that I enroll, the outcomes that we are looking for, then there can be more of the balanced type of approach of the outcomes you're looking for in that. Yes, please. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I'm so glad that uh, my colleague brought up this notion of winners and losers. My concern, uh, and I would, would love to hear your, your comments on this, concern, it centers around student winners and losers. Mm -hmm. In the previous presentation, um, there was a, a graphic that showed when the funding was there, that students who were poor graduated at the same rate as those who had money. But in your presentation, in this PBF, and I really appreciate you using my initials to name <laughs> this, um, <laughs> in this PBF model, um, the Pell Grant, those students who were poor, those students who were often first time, first generation uh, college students were not sought after in order to get to the end result of improvement in that university system. Could you address that and how is that maintaining equity and balance for our students, which is the number one objective of why we're all volunteering all our time? Mm -hmm. Answer I would give to that has to go to a, a little bit of the, the outcomes we see is a, a small decline in terms of the total uh, Pell recipients enrolling in performance-based funding institutions. A again, the data is still out there. There's still a lot of questions about the accuracy of all of those studies, but that's at least a, a good study we've seen that tracked and saw the, the d decrease in terms of Pell recipients on campus. Uh, I think it does go to a little of the, the equity or the mission of the institution. Uh, we know that from a lot of data, from a lot of research out there, that Pell recipients, low-income students, need additional student supports. They often have lower six-year graduation rates, five-year graduation rates, four-year graduation rates, higher opportunities and, and levels of dropping out of the institution. So from the institutional perspective, it often takes more resources to help those students be successful and even to identify when they are at risk at certain times. There's a lot of other great data out there that shows that those students might be moving through okay, not hitting any uh, academic alert systems and other systems we have in place and still are very highly at risk of dropping out. But it takes pretty sophisticated data analysis, analytical platforms to do some of that and to help identify those students. Uh, so the, the trick, though, I think comes into, again, the weighting. If we were to weight Pell recipient students higher than we do for our traditional or core students in some ways, then there is a bit of, again, the incentive to enroll those students and have their outcomes be successful. But given at least some of the data we've seen in, from the reports and from the results, uh, it has not necessarily gotten to that point just yet. 
I think it probably should be a focus, that's my personal perspective on this, uh, I have to admit, that that should be a focused population, a focused student population that we're not necessarily abandoning uh, so that we can in some ways game the system and make sure that we get students in that are likely to graduate. Uh, but at least from the data we see, that has not yet been the case completely. Yes, please. You have no questions, Andrew. Thank you. That uh, presentation was a great deal to grapple with and, and wrap your arms around, but thank you for that. One thing that uh, stood out to me was the need for a long-term commitment to actually have any idea whether this is going to be successful or to see success. What are, and, you, and yet you had, you couldn't even tell some states, they're in, they're out, not <laughs> really sure, they're halfway in. What determines that will uh, for the long-term commitment and for um, moving towards success with such a model? Is it a political will? Is it, is it the, is it the uh, complexity of, the, of explaining it? Is it administrative issues? What determines whether a state will really take this model and, and be willing to put that long-term commitment in place? I don't know. I, I wish I, again, could, could quote a great study or quote a great research piece that says, here's how these uh, types of systems have staying power and have that commitment. <laughs> Conversationally and anecdotally, uh, I think part of it is the commitment financially to this type of system, that if this is something that's going to be pursued, a large portion of the funds of base allocations are going to be put up as a part of the performance or the outcomes-based funding system. I, I also think it's certainly a, a more personal leadership perspective, that this is something that's set out as the strategic initiative or strategic mission of a system or of institutions or of a state, and it's followed through upon and not wavered upon at different times. Th those models, and we say those that we don't know which states might be competing or which ones are actually adopting a model today versus yesterday, that's basically a system in place where there aren't significant amounts of fund at risk and there isn't a long-term commitment to it from both the state assembly, the state legislatures, from the state systems, from, from the institutions themselves uh, to participate in these types of models. Again, no one right way to go about making sure that it has staying power and that it has that, but those would be anecdotally the things that have come up most often for me in conversation uh, of why it has been effective over, say, seven years or 10 years or even beyond that. I, I always feel very bad when I get a lot of questions and there is no one answer. As a researcher, you want that one answer that you can just very, very succinctly say, here is what it is. Performance-based funding and outcomes-based funding does not lend itself to that type of answer just yet. Any other questions? Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you again, uh, Matthew and uh, Andrew. Thank you as well. Um, we're pleased to have Andrew here with us at the university, and he's... Uh, He's participating heavily in our strategic planning process, as you know, and uh, he's, he's a great resource for all of us. And Matthew, thanks for coming all the way down here, particularly in your situation at the moment. So we, we wish you the best. Uh, as Margaret mentioned earlier, and as I've heard from several members of this board, these presentations have been especially informative as we think about our strategic planning process. I know that President Spellings and, and her team is working on the future slate of speakers, and we look forward to hearing from more of our nation's thought leaders in the coming months. Before we wrap up uh, this morning's session, I wanted to expand on, on Margaret's comments about the strategic planning efforts and where we want to be at the end of the day and at the end of this year. Ultimately, over the next several months, we want to build a final plan that succinctly defines the themes and identifies clear, measurable goals and specific metrics with timelines and targets that will hold us all accountable as we go forward. Now, unfortunately, Matthew has just told us that that's impossible, but we'll, <laughs> we'll continue. Uh, we need a plan that this board can fully own and support a plan that involves input and guidance from all of our constituencies and specifically from our chancellors and faculty who are on the front lines doing the work to educate our students every day. As said earlier, we had a very productive conversation with the faculty assembly last week 
And it is crystal clear to me that we're going to need all of the players from across the system to get this plan done. We've got tremendous resources in our staff, our, our chancellors, our faculty, and here in this room and our board members. And no doubt the timeline is aggressive and this is not an easy task. However, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. The board has and will continue to receive a lot of valuable input like we've received today. So let's use it. Let's leave no stone unturned. Let's work to have our themes, goals, and realistic metrics in place by the end of the year. I have full confidence in this board, in the chancellors, and in the president that we can arrive at something we can all support and be proud of. And I thank all of you for, for participating in this, in this process. So at this time, I think lunch is being served uh, out, out there, and we will convene our meetings at uh, 1 p.m. Thank you all very much. Thank you.